nos acompanhar o debate Feminismo Negro, Resistência e Ação. Mas antes da gente já chamar nossos participantes, nossas convidadas, eu vou contar para vocês um pouquinho sobre a Fundação Rosa Luxemburgo, que é uma organização alemã vinculada ao partido de Link, e ela tem 23 escritórios no mundo. Aqui no Brasil, ela atua desde 2013, desculpa, desde 2003, e promove projetos que visam estimular o pensamento crítico. Entre esses projetos, nós temos o livro Vozes Insurgentes de Mulheres Negras, que vocês encontram para download gratuito. Vocês conseguem PDF lá na nossa página. Quando sair daqui da, da nossa live, terminar a nossa live, eu vou disponibilizar também o PDF nas nossas redes. Você pode acessar o Facebook, também pelo, pelo Twitter e o Instagram. Você vai encontrar o caminho para poder fazer o download desse livro. E, além do Vozes, vocês encontram outros livros, como Passe Livre, também disponível para download, e a coleção Emergências. São cinco livros da coleção Emergências, que também estão todos disponíveis para download lá na nossa página. E para dar sequência aqui, também para fazer uma, uma saudação antes de começar o nosso debate, eu convido o nosso diretor aqui do escritório Brasil Paraguai, Torg Ludin. Olá, Torg. Oi, Catarine, muito obrigado e boa noite. Pois, é, eu sou Torg Ludin, o diretor do escritório da Fundação Rosa Luxemburgo, aqui em São Paulo. É, a Catarine já explicou um pouco... Catarine da nossa... has already explained that our foundation has the name of a woman like Rosa Luxemburgo. She was a Jewish mother and she fought her whole life against oppression, against the militaries and in favor of a fair society. And more than a hundred years later, she was murdered by the extreme right militia and she never silenced herself and she was with her revolutionary spirit and her different political positions she was an inspiration in our foundation we believe that today women are in the front lines in different movements and all different organizations and uh, those that have to resist and fight for life. So this is the action we are doing here. This is the activity we're doing here. We're going to talk about uh, black feminism as part of this field of work of resistance. When we were talking about the struggle of women in Latin America and of course Brazil and in the US and I have to talk about black women and of course we have to open the space for them to speak to give them voice they are the protagonists of the movement the foundation Rosa Luxemburgo is within their struggle side by side with the oppressed we support different activities in favor of democracy to champion uh, social and political rights at a global level and in favor of a fair society and our guests Agnelli and Gina will enlighten us today and talk about talk to us about this uh, struggle it is a pleasure to welcome uh, our guests who will share this evening with us and we will have our project coordinator from Rosa Luxemburgo in Sao Paulo coordinating Cristiane Gomes Chris you have the floor thank you so much thank you Torg well good evening to all of you good afternoon uh, welcome, uh, all of you. I am Cristiane Gomes. I am a project coordinator of the Rosa Luxemburgo Foundation, and it is a pleasure uh, to be here with our guests so that we can stop and reflect and think about how the uh, how black feminism has been part of our society, has impacted transformation, and uh, the progress we wish to have in our different societies. So I'd like to thank all of you for participating in the space so that we can together uh, think about the topic. It's important to highlight 
that black feminism as a practice exists even before the concept itself. Black feminism is from when African black women were enslaved and came to the Americas. They were kidnapped from their original countries. And these lands in the North American lands, uh, South American lands, Center American uh, lands, were trying to find a way of acting to recreate their culture, their lives, that is, in very objective terms, to survive. It's important to highlight that Black women were essential for that the Black population in general to, uh, in different aspects. At the end of uh, the slavery process, they followed the same way. This is why we have been fighting against all the different ways of killing, including epistemicide. We were formulating and organizing our knowledge of what we do today, which is black feminism, or in other words, the action of black women. Our journey hasn't been easy, but we are here today to talk to you, to dialogue, and to find a way to put our action to bring in our concrete practice the different elements of black fe feminism where we are able to bring together the different gender identity race identity class and sexual orientation and it's important to highlight and i always try to highlight this that when we talk about black feminism and intersectionality, we're not only talking about knowledges that were built in universities, which certainly is essential, especially when we talk about the uh, growing uh, spaces in universities by Black women, but we talk about our daily lives of community leaders who dedicate their lives to champion different rights and the work of uh, poets, writers, composers, artists, mothers, uh, domestic maids, samba dancers, scientists, blues singers, students, and yalorishas, and also congresswomen. Black, femi Black feminism is a revolution and ancestrality. It is even against the conservative uh, offensive we have in Brazil, in the US, in Europe, in the world in general in the past. Black women were essential, or the movement of Black women was essential for the survival of the Black population. Today, we follow in the same path, in the same journey. More than resisting, Black women have different proposals and paths for the society we have. Today, we will reflect a little bit about this with our guests that are more than special in this uh, afternoon with us. In their different ways, they are able to show and talk about uh, black feminism and the action of black women and to start with a high note it is my pleasure to invite our de dear gina uh, gina tant she is an associate professor of feminist studies uh, history of the uh, wakeness and at the university of california in santa cruz and uh, she was the chairperson of the feminist department. And before that, she was director of the Institute for Advanced Feminism Research and uh, at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and also a main researcher of a trans, uh, transnationalization, transnationalizing. And she was also the director of popular culture, New York, New Press, and the author of many uh, papers on race, uh, popular culture. She has taught about race, feminism in Brazil, Colombia, and Sweden. Her next book, uh, in the co-authorship with Angela Davis, Erica Miners, and Beth Richards, is called uh, Abolition of Feminism Now. And I hope it doesn't take so long to come to Brazil to be translated into Portuguese. So it is my pleasure to welcome Gina Dent. Welcome and thank you for being here with us today. Thank you so much for the welcome, Cristiani. It's wonderful to see you again, even in this way, at this long distance. And my friend Anieli as well. Um, I want to thank the Rosen Luxembourg Foundation for uh, in bringing us together and inviting us. 
Um, and of course, they're also responsible for our meeting each other. So I'm, I'm very pleased for that. Um, I, I'm just so happy to um, be with you all and I look forward to talking. It's especially important right now. I, I feel today that I'm using all of my resources as a Black feminist because I am speaking to you from California. There are fires all around me. People are evacuating not very far from us. Um, even at my university today. So today uh, I speak to you uh, through the fire uh, like black women have done for so many centuries. Gina, querida, muito obrigada novamente. É, pra... Thank you again, Gina, for your words. So thank you for your availability, for your time, and all is so uh, caring and special and warm. I would like to start if you could maybe share with us, uh, based on the way as a Black woman and a historian, well, how would the concepts of Black feminism, how are they reaching civil society? How is this uh, feminism in all its diversity, how has this impacted the uh, social and political organization in the processes that you follow? Well, um, I'm a Black feminist because of my existence in this world, because of my research, and because of the activism I've been involved with since I was a young person. And uh, I'm seeing now how that work is being recognized and lifted up and spoken about not only by Black women, but by others who are joining and understanding and seeing and recognizing the work that has been done for so many years. In many ways, Black feminism has always been the work that has been suppressed. It's the work that was disappeared. It's the work that we fail to recognize often in movements. And so much of the scholarly work, the work in my environment, has been about restoring to visibility that work, uh, telling us about the history of all of those who preceded us, uh, teaching us what they went through, what they did, how they participated, especially when their names and their work has been omitted from our histories and from our archives. That work now, even though in this moment where we're facing COVID and climate change and and our repressive governments that we both are living under today, that work is being recognized. It's becoming very useful, even in the public. And it's surprising for me to see all of that work suddenly recognized in new ways. But it's a reminder that the work of Black feminism is often that work that gets recognized for one moment and then is forgotten as we tell the story of movements. We could talk even today about the Black Lives Matter movement and about the way that we know that the three co-founders of that movement who were just talking to each other as friends, uh, working together out of their respective movements about the tragedy of all of the killings. And they said to each other, Black Lives Matter. And that movement from its founding was grounded in the practices of Black feminism the ways that Black feminism requires us to collaborate with each other, to bring all with us, to respect and show affection for each other, and also to question the modalities that are violent in our culture that we need to reject. And yet when we talk about Black Lives Matter today, sometimes we forget that this is a feminist movement. So it's important for us as scholars and activists to lift up that legacy and to speak about it today. Even in this moment, today actually, I was supposed to be in Cachoeira with you, with you in Brazil, teaching Black feminisms. I am very sad that COVID has made it impossible for me to be there at the university, but I'm very, very happy to have this conversation with you in its place. There's so much more to say about what Black feminism is. 
But I think I want to focus now because it has become something that people talk about everywhere. And we could think about it in so many ways, so many ways that we could even make plural the term black feminism. It could be black feminisms. And yet black feminism has always claimed all of its pieces. It has always been generous in embracing everything that has come from it, even as you said, Christiani, things that did not have the name black feminism. Black feminism is always that generous feminism that is willing to negotiate the difficult problems between us, within us, and in conversation with others. Now, we are far from each other, but I feel the most important part to me is to be connected, especially internationally today. In our environment in the United States now, we speak almost exclusively of what's happening for us. We talk a lot about the repressive government we suffer through today and the repression of hundreds of years. We talk of enslavement. We talk of the need for reparations. But we don't talk as much today about the connection to others in the diaspora, in Africa, and in the rest of the world. And so it's important to me to be connected to you so that we could talk about that legacy of Black feminism, that one which is also suppressed. As someone who was formally trained to do this work, I was lucky that when I began to go to college, I had a professor named Anani Gigenio, Anani who um, is not Brazilian, is a, is a well-known scholar of Brazil. So I was very fortunate as a young person to meet Lele Gonzalez, to meet uh, many others who came to Brown University where I was studying. And so my exposure to Black feminism was always an international feminism. And it was always connected, especially to Brazil. So I greet you from afar, happy to be able to think with you about how Black feminism is changing. Thank you, Gina. Thank you so much. So uh, let us continue our conversation uh, with our next guest. So let's hear a little bit from our next guest. And uh, I thank her so much for being here today. Uh, Aniele uh, Franco. Aniele is an athlete, a writer, a professor, a mother, director of the Marielle Franco Foundation. And uh, thank you so much uh, for your presence here to have. We know that you have a very tight schedule, very dynamic schedule. So thank you so much for being here with us today. So we welcome uh, this evening. I thank you. I am such a great uh, partner. No, uh, yes. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Agora foi? Não tô ouvindo. Será que você ouvindo? Tirei o fone para ver se melhorava. Ah, desculpa. Agora sim. Yes. Tá now. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. So I put the headset because it's better. Because we have children running around and then. So thank you. Thank you for the invitation. It is a pleasure to be here. Uh, we are partners. Uh, the foundation has been a partner since even before the Marielle Franca Institute. Cris is like a sister. So thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with our muse, Gina Dent. We talk a lot about on WhatsApp and uh, I'm a big fan of both of you, Chris and Gina. And I want to guarantee my book, please. I want a copy, okay? I'm, I'm doing this online uh, and uh, so I'm asking for my copy. We hope it won't take so long to be translated and to be brought to us in Brazil. So, uh, Aniele, 
So we are following everything that has been happening, uh, the different actions that Maria de Franco Institute has been doing. Uh, this is something with in a partnership with Rosa Luxemburgo. And I would like you to tell us a little bit about what motivated you to create this institute. How do you believe that this legacy of Marielle, of your sister, has impacted our society? And what has that to do with Black feminism? If you could maybe tell us a little bit about that. Since March, March 14, and we've been following everything in a great struggle, and we have been invited to participate in different events around the world. And we saw different stories, and those who also had their uh, lives impacted. So uh, we saw the size of her legacy and the responsibility we had in our hands. And uh, we we know that that was a world cause. Uh, everything was working at a world basis. And we have Marielle's blood. We are blood, we are sisters. We had to have give continuity to everything she did. And this is when we had this desire. We had to concentrate in something that we could honor. And not only um, Marielle's blood, something that was done so cruelly against her that evening. So uh, to honor this woman, this woman uh, we refer to a woman who was able to overcome diversity, a woman who goes down in history, you know, honoring the value she, she championed, you know. And from that moment on, Chris, we decided to create the Marielle Franco Institute in a place where we could have our, to make immortal our ancestry. So not only I was able to concentrate everything in a single place where I can do these different works that Mari did, but also uh, where I can make my ancestrality immortal. And we fight for justice. We have to champion her memory. We have to uh, disclose her legacy and to sow the seeds of Marielle and uh, to make this a place that could become a reference space for Marielle's family. The best answer. We understood that the best answer could provide to society was to actually build a place to show the, her legacy, her legacy of strength, and show all the story, show Marielle's story, because her story inspires women all over the world. There were plenty of candidates running for office after Marielle was murdered. Plenty of them were elected, but she is an influence for other people in the world. But as regards to your second question, Marielle's legacy is highly collective and it affects, it shows a huge impact for us to bring about change in society. We are a black family from the favelas and we have strong matriarchal ties within our family. So Marielle was born within that and her legacy shows the leadership of black women in Brazil to bring about change in Brazil. We, our bodies have constructions and now we are changing the structures. Plenty of people try to make black life impossible. And I believe, and uh, Gina has mentioned that, but just to, to wrap up, Marielle Franco's legacy, her biggest impact was to create other perspectives of future in society where we black women play a lead role. This is how I would like to define it. Black women play a lead role in building a fairer and more equal justice in world. 
we keep on talking about Marielle's work, and I think that Marielle's legacy relates to black feminism, and it shows that oppressions of race, gender, and class are connected, and liberation for us black women are only going to bring about to come when we overcome racism, class, and gender oppression. And uh, black women, we need to come together and build this difference and new practices connected to our ancestry. And um, Marielle was woman race and her legacy is linked to her principles. And she brought huge contributions to black feminism. Thank you, Anieli. So thinking on the on your initial speech, black women action. And when we think about um, black feminism, I like to say black feminism and black women's action, because this way we can cater to all women, even black women who don't see themselves as feminists, but in their everyday action, they in their everyday struggle and activism. For instance, here in Brazil, mothers, mothers fighting for justice um, for children who were killed by the state. So these women who fight for struggle for justice, they have a deep, they show deep leadership in action for justice and plenty of them don't see themselves as feminist so that's how i that's why i feel like saying black feminism and black women's action and black women's action is highly collective and just like anieli said and considering what gina said black feminism is a gentle and generous place to provide support for black women and we share different struggles within this space currently we're facing a very delicate moment the capitalist system is finding a hard time now due to the COVID-19 pandemic and both Brazil and the US we are suffering a lot, not only with the virus, but also with policies to fight COVID-19 and the, the spread of, of the conservative wave. It's taking over the institutional politics. In spite, we Black women, we're leading resistance. Later on, I'll talk about that again, but I'd like you to comment currently facing COVID-19 pandemic and this process where we see increased inequality, especially facing the Black population, especially Black women are faced with increased inequality. How? I would like you to comment um, your views on this, how are women organizing? How are black women organizing within society to create actions in response to such a difficult moment that we need to respond to what's going on? Um, inequality is deepening. However, there's lots of action. Black women are in action now. I would like you to comment about that. And I think that we could start listening to Gina, please. Well, Chris, you are right. We are in a very difficult moment, but it is one that we are prepared for. Uh, this is important to understand because especially in the United States, as more and more black women were considered to be people we would listen to, became famous writers, became um, important filmmakers now, uh, it appears as if we are no longer 
tied to this past of inequality and slavery. But we know that the legacies of those structures have not been dismantled. And we know that those few who have been able to uh, be privileged enough to speak and to write and create like we have are only a small portion of our community. Fortunately for us, the struggles for our communities have given us many, many challenges over years that we have used to prepare. We have understood how to take care of our health. We have even something in the United States that began as the Black Women's Health Project that was deeply focused back generations, a generation ago on understanding the different kinds of harm that Black women suffer, but not dwelling in that harm. I think the characteristic of Black feminism has always been not merely to be resilient or strong, because I know that we spend a lot of time being critical of how those labels ignore our suffering. But we do have strategies, we do have techniques, we do have experience, and we do know from this experience living with so much struggle, how to be kind and generous to others around us, how to work with each other because none of us has what we need on our own. Our being bound to each other because of these struggles means that as we meet this current moment, Black feminism has been useful not only for Black women, but for the entire society because we have so much practice in making do with very little. We know, and every time I'm exhausted from managing with this pandemic and with everything that is going on, I realize that I come from women who managed a household other than their own, as well as their own. We know how to do this. We know how to be loving even when we haven't been loved. We know how to share space with others who are also vulnerable. I think one of the most important features of Black feminism, and we don't always highlight it, is the way it embraces all other struggles. And of course, now we are challenged because those we have in the public, for example, last night, Kamala Harris spoke in the United States to accept the nomination for vice president. But I remember that she is not the first black woman who has run for a major national office. We had in 1968, Charlene Mitchell, my dear friend, who ran on the Communist Party ticket for president. And we have Angela Davis, as you know, and we have others who have run for these offices, but not for the mainstream parties in the main, except for Shirley Chisholm. But it's important for us to see that those traces from the past and into the present show us how our way of moving forward has been taken up. Kamala Harris spoke last night in much of the language that comes from Black feminism. And yet we cannot be fooled. We need to understand that just as she is lifting up a legacy of Black feminism, we are also going to continue to be radically engaged in understanding how capitalism is doing such deep damage to us. So we cannot be taken by the successes that we have. We must use them to voice for those who have no voice. And this is what Black women do. We see this 
with how many black women doctors are being um, used during this COVID um, crisis to speak about what is going on. We need them, but we also need all of us to come together and bring these skills that we've been building over these years. Anne, vamos te ouvir agora. Now we're listening to Aniele Franco. Hey, my friend, I was going to say, you know, first of all, I would say that Black women's activism is always on the front line, always on the front line. And the other day I was talking to Marcelli. She, she's great, she's my pal. And I was talking to her and I would like to mention two things here. This year has been a very hard year for everybody. It's a pandemic and a worldwide pandemic. And we had to, you know, become new people. And Maria Lefranco Institute, we were going to structure everything. And in March, we were we had to think of new ideas and new come up with new solutions to help our people as uh, gina has crazy ass trump in the us we have our own crazy ass bolsonaro here and we need to you know do something because black people are the ones who um do something i would just like to mention two comrades I would like to talk about Agora é a Hora, Now It's the Time. It's a project and uh, there are over 2000 leaderships for us to help those women actually get government um, support. Gina, I don't know if you're aware, but Brazilian government, um, at first President Bolsonaro wanted to grant people 200 reais as financial support, but for people um, 200 reais was too little and then we all managed to convince him to provide 600 and through the project we helped women to register and get resources from this emergency support and as we were trying to find black leadership we found out about loads of other women who were doing new things they started selling um turbans and they started selling food but you know people like me who come from the favelas we invent things we invent work and we focus on survival and black women are the ones on the front line of the pandemic and the other thing i would like to comment on is black women decide and maria my daughter is trying to participate i'm sorry uh, but Black Women Decide, Mulheres Negras Decidem, uh, Carol, Ju, and Fabi, we put together a report and we found out many things. And we managed to see through the report that plenty of Black women, we, we already knew that, but highly qualified black women make less money and now they're even more affected during the pandemic so even if you're highly qualified you need to reinvent yourself again and Marcelli, my friend um, that i talked about before she's been delivering food packets for people and she's been going to favelas another project that we dealt with is favelas in corona favelas without corona so we were doing that crazy looping as Marielle Franco Institute that we were connecting different people and not only in Rio de Janeiro but all over Brazil just to wrap up I provided you Chris with three examples with three campaigns led by black women those campaigns were designed by black women and 
Those campaigns were supported by Instituto Marielle Franco. We are trying to survive, inspire, and provide support to Black women activists, Black women activists, and we wanted to show the meaning of voluntary work in a context of a crisis and the logistic capacity to maximize their actions. Perfect, Aniele. Thank you. We know that those solidarity actions targeted at poor, um, disenfranchised Black people, we know Black women are on the lead. They're on the front line doing all of the work. And we know the fact that the government doesn't provide enough support. The government doesn't actually try to help those families survive. For instance, here in Sao Paulo, Sao Paulo is a metropolis, a big city, but I'll provide some data on Sao Paulo that people in Sao Paulo outskirts are facing hunger again and the action of social movements and community leaderships is key to provide support for those people and those families. Now, I would like to, I would like to consider the institutional front. And as Aniele has said, elections are coming 2018. 2018 elections left a legacy showing Marielle's strength and Plenty of Black women ran for office, even trans Black women, they ran for office. And it's interesting that they ran for representative positions, which is mainly dominated by white men focused on patriarchy and uh, heterosexual white guys who represent uh, patriarchy and we've been fighting patriarchy we know that patriarchy is killing us every day those are the people who decide on our fate as regards pu public policies but um Thinking about what I said when we first started, um, we've been struggling for long and um, we have victories. 2018 was core for us. When Marielle was murdered, people were trying to interrupt her trajectory. And in 2018, plenty of black women were elected and this process is going on and it's strong and powerful. Vilma Hayes, a sociologist, and she's a reference in the Black women's movement in Brazil, and she always says that the new politics aesthetic is for Black women and the um, feminist wave is a no uh, no way to come back and we know it's a hard journey not easy at all a couple of days ago we had a uh, an exchange here at the rosa luxemburgo when we're talking about uh, black women participation in the institutionality so we had uh, Carolina Benedita da Silva, Vilma Reis, uh, Bentes, Jo Cavalcanti, Selma de Aldina, and I invite, of course, all of you who are listening to us uh, to go to our Rosa Luxemburgo channels and watch this uh, conversation it was a very powerful moment and it was very uh, strengthening uh what Torg said in the beginning the director of the foundation here in brazil he said that we at the uh, rosa luxemburgo foundation are in the process of strengthening the political development and bringing in a new proposal and narrative to the movement itself and here in brazil we will have municipal elections uh, shortly this year 
for uh, the mayors and the council members. And we are able to see that even with the uh, difficulty uh, in financing campaigns of having a political space, black women are organizing themselves in order to occupy these spaces, also these municipal and political spaces. So if maybe Gina, uh, Gina brought to us a little bit of um, uh, Kamala Harris as an example, you know, the uh, vice president in the uh, uh, presidential elections. We will have municipal elections now in Brazil and you in the US uh, with uh, the presidential elections this year. And not only uh, Kamala Harris, others, uh, you know, are also in uh, this struggle, even Angela Davis herself. And so I'd like to hear a little bit from you, your opinion and your expectations in terms of how we can occupy these spaces, this institutional space, the political space, that is. It is worthwhile mentioning here, and Nadi Aniele talked about the emergency help or assistance, and it's being used now as a uh, electoral propaganda. Uh, so the president is using it to reelect himself with this aid. So it was only approved because the opposition in Congress and among this uh, opposition, uh, black women uh, included, did a whole work in order to approve this help, this aid in the beginning of the pandemic when we started social isolation in March. So it's important to also to highlight this and to make you maybe reference to, to this. So I'd like to hear from you a little bit about your expectations in terms of uh, this, uh, you know, Brazil, US, with regards to this process of occupying the new spaces by black women, not only as something, you know, specific, focused, uh, punctual or specific, but in the strategic movement and trying to see maybe if down the road how we can occupy this uh, space. So if we could start with uh, Gina. Mm, thank you, Chris. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a very exciting time. I mentioned Kamala Harris and and anyone from the the landscape of the left of the United States understands that her history is not the one that many of us would want to embrace. There are aspects of her work as especially a prosecutor that an attorney general in California that are very difficult to reconcile with the desires of our movements. However, um, black women and black feminism has always been able to do both and. We are experts at understanding that we need to vote. In fact, in the United States, researchers sometimes refer to black women as the most rational voters. We are the ones who tend to vote in our own interests in the highest percentage percentages. In other words, we are pragmatic and strategic and can understand where we will benefit, even as we know that anyone who would propose to lead the United States would not have all of the political positions that I might want them to have. So it's very important for us now to be getting out the vote, we must, we absolutely must learn from our recent history and not allow our electoral politics to be abandoned purely because we understand some of the faults that have been um, at the heart of the Democratic Party. Um, those things are true, but Black women and Black feminism are really always about understanding how we get, as Anieli said, we survive. Christy said survive as well. We survive and then we plan to do what's next. We do now have a movement of people, younger people who are taking offices uh, in uh, local governments in the United States. And of course, I was fortunate to meet some of the, the newly elected leadership in Brazil 
on my most recent trip there, uh, Erica Malonguino and others. Um, and it was uh, very exciting to meet people who are not cynical about what it means to be in leadership, who understand that they will, by virtue of their positions, be criticized by the very people that they have been in movements with. But we need to understand how to be critical, how to push, and how to love simultaneously. As I said before, Kamala Harris spoke in much of the language of Black feminism, but she didn't speak in the language of abolition feminism, the language that I prefer, a language which is about abolishing the functions of the police, the security state, the militarized environment that we live in, and that exacerbates the suffering of so, so many. Of course, we don't support this. Abolition feminism must always be thinking about a better way forward. But the better way forward has to follow our being in the moment that we're in now politically. And this is where Black feminism can be so very useful because we don't throw out the things that are our legacies, even if they are not where we want to be in our future. We're always looking to the future, but we respect our past. And Harris and others, they represent that. It's also important in our environment to talk about Kamala Harris in particular as a different kind of person. She is, yes, a Black woman. She's also a woman of Indian descent. And this is something that in our environment can be hard to talk about. Um, black feminism, in my estimation, should be the space where we discuss the various kinds of backgrounds and ancestries and complicated legacies and histories that we share. And it's important for us to understand what it means to think about someone who is descended from recent immigrants, both from slave pasts and from those that may not be slave pasts. And to talk about this and to accept that as central to our way of being in the world, to what we want to see in the future. But these are tensions that even within Black feminist communities, we are negotiating today. So as we try to move into leadership, how do we maintain an anti-capitalist stance? It is almost impossible these days to talk about capitalism, even as we talk about class. But we are going to have to be the ones who continue in that journey. And so I hope that the various people that are uh, going into office and wanting to run will inspire more and more younger people to do this. And yet it's the responsibility of the rest of us who are not in elected office to make sure that we keep imagining and dreaming and building so that they can follow us. She's perfect, isn't she? Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Aniele? Perfect as always, Gina. You're such a dear. I love this woman. Anyways, so, so first, I believe that it's important to highlight uh, how uh, women, Black women, have been uh, confronting the, pand the pandemic. I believe that the elections in 2020 Wait, let me close my WhatsApp, it's open here. Um, so the 2020 elections should have different protagonism that should be connected with uh, the anti-racist uh, racist movements that we've been seeing and witnessing in the main capitals around the world. However, also because of the political uh, front and where we have many black women, the women's movement and where they have been working for years and years. We have different agendas associated to uh, systemic inequality, which was broadened and made worse by the pandemic. The old, and here I put air quotes, the old uh, political space is no longer 
our space, like Marielle and myself, we all have seen these bodies producing new ways of occupying these functional spaces uh, with different knowledges and different practices. And uh, the ex political experience of Black women has to be recognized and valued. And I, this is something I is very dear to me. And I always say this sentence, the engagement of these bodies in the political space is uh, absolutely essential. It's a way to break with the structural uh, tradition to find solutions that are truly effective for society in general, something that has to happen and has to start with us. People have to understand that there will only be an improvement if it starts with us. My expectation for this election now, uh, the, uh, the presidential elections in the US and in Brazil, is that we can ad minimally advance racial debate. And when I when I reiterate and when I stress that the parties, all parties, left, right, whatever, what they have to do is a self-racial criticism. And they have to do that now because this is, you know, uh, how you can, you can learn uh, and learn from history with Black activism from the past. And here in the Maria de Franco Institute, we launched the report, as I told you about, and uh, the second question that Chris asked, observing directly how black women have been active and its election we can contribute even to uh, find new paths new ways uh, for these people who are making their bodies available for the movement to truly move the racist structure which is established not only in brazil but around the world and it's and we have to have a protagonist role to be really in the front lines fighting racism fighting uh, the patriarchy. And to conclude, I would like to say that this institutional occupation by uh, Black women is uh, something that is historical, uh, from Lélia Gonzalez, Juliana Batista, Benedita da Silva, and Marielle Franco. And we have to understand this past, this legacy. It was always a political agenda in the Black movement. We have to recognize that. So since the abolition we've been fighting to have our bodies uh, recognized our political bodies recognized when you refer to this and we talked about Vandalay and saying that we come from way back when it's it's historical and the movement of black women in politics and to me is the possibility of thinking about new uh, achievements of developing a new society thank you Agnelli so we have people listening to us uh, online on our YouTube and Facebook uh, channel, uh, also on YouTube. So we have, we don't have that long, but if uh, anyone wishes to maybe uh, submit a question, uh, you can send it to us. We have here our team, uh, Katarini uh, is checking all the questions. She's helping me with this uh, interface with our different networks. So uh, we're open for questions if you want to submit it in questions. And I also, I want to greet uh, Guilherme Ortega from the Base Isto uh, Organization from Paraguay, uh, with whom we also develop uh, projects and different works. The foundation is here in Brazil, but also in Paraguay. So I'd like to greet Guillermo, who is watching us. And um, so continue while we uh, wait to, to see if any questions will be submitted. Um, uh, we know there are many questions. Oh, I, I know I have tons of questions, uh, but uh, let's see. So. Gina uh, talked about uh, abolitionist feminism. And if you could talk a little bit more about that, uh, we have been learning much about this. And if you could uh, maybe highlight some of uh, what you're bringing, the content you're bringing in your new book in a free translation to Portuguese, uh, it would be uh, abolition feminism now. Uh, if you could maybe share a little bit about your content uh, of, of this book and of this concept, of this action, of what exactly uh, this means and uh, what you've said before about this oppressive hand of the state and what uh, we in Brazil 
are confronted with a genocide of our black youth. Every 23 minutes, a young black man or woman is killed in our country. So we've Even with the pandemic, this didn't end. This didn't stop. Aniele also could maybe talk a little bit about this. Uh, we have, this is something that happens throughout Brazil, but of course Rio de Janeiro has uh, sometimes all the uh, lights on it. And so maybe I could hear a little bit about your book about um, abolitionist feminism. Sure. Um, the term, even in English, the term abolition feminism is a complicated one. Uh, in a way, the label of abolition feminism was actually created because of the opposite. Uh, there was a, a history, a legacy of feminism that many of us needed to move away from was a legacy of feminism that used harms done to women and girls as an excuse for further kinds of criminalization. In many ways, the anti-violence movement, I'm referring to the movement against domestic violence and other forms of gendered violence, had been an excuse uh, for enhancing and increasing the size of the criminal justice system. In fact, uh, a complicated story, but one worth talking about is the role of uh, Vice President Biden, our candidate for president, uh, in developing the Violence Against Women Act. We tend, in general, people tend to talk about that as one of his important achievements and about the recognition of the violence happening to women. But the other side of that act is the way it imagined what would correct for that violence. How would we become more safe? How would we become more secure? Much of the language of that act was either disciplining of women themselves or gave resources to the criminal justice system as it exists today. And that is only going to have negative effects on women, on girls, on trans people, on all those who suffer from gendered violence, which can include any of us. And so Elizabeth Bernstein, actually, a scholar at uh, Barnard College in New York, came up with the term carceral feminism. And that was a label for those who were invested in the form of feminism that would continue to bolster and increase the size of our current criminal justice system, what some people call the criminal injustice system. So instead, we are abolition feminists. We are feminists who have moved away from carcerality as our main option. We don't want protection provided by the state that comes in the form of violence against our own people. We don't want to invest in all of the kinds of systems that have compounded the forms of violence that we already exist with. So black feminism has been really important in this abolition feminism. When we're talking today about the movement, for example, to get police out of schools, I should emphasize this. We have police, sometimes police departments for schools, but recently we have become successful in some parts of this country in voting out the cops from schools. It sounds like something we should never have to struggle for, but it is. So we are anti-carceral feminists. So we are abolition feminists. The term abolition, of course, comes to us because it reminds us of the abolition movement against slavery. So we use the same term 
but we are talking about abolishing legacies of slavery because incarceration and policing is another legacy of slavery. It is not gone. It has been transformed into something which continues to cage those who are not considered to be at the center of society. And so abolition feminism is about not only focusing on the damage that the carceral system has done, but really focusing on the dreaming and imagining and collective work that shows us other ways of being. And many of the kinds of things we have to do are forms of healing that are required because of all the damage done to us in generations. We must learn to love differently again. We must pull on those parts of our tradition that were not entirely shattered or rebuild them. We must think about other ways of imagining what we want to have happen when there are harms. And I should add before anyone may ask this in the questions, abolition feminists are not naive to harms done in society. We know that there are violences because we are often the ones who suffer from them the most. However, we do not think that the answer to those violences is more violence. We know that that break makes a circle of violence, which will always return to us, to our people and to those we love. And so that abolition feminism is what's really driving me today. It's at the core of all of the movements that I participate in and, and at many that I see around me. And it is from there that we get strength now to move forward. I should say just as a, maybe also a question for you, but as something I think about a lot from my visits to Brazil and from my study of Brazil from a long time ago, I was always inspired thinking about the Quilombos to thinking about the traditions of independence um, and those traditions are not as rich and strong in the United States. So I have struggled to learn a lot about those traditions from my connection to all of you. And I, I wanna talk now also about the Landless Workers Movement, the MST. Uh, I met Chris, of course, we, we were at the MST school in Sao, near Sao Paulo together. And um, I have re recently learned about what's happening in Minas with the evictions. And so I, I'm both looking to Brazil for uh, a legacy of independence and self-reliance and loving care and community. And I'm also looking at the disruption of those communities that have been built. And I would love to hear from the two of you about what's going on. Aniele, please carry on. I, I, I was trying to make people be quiet at home, but it's difficult. It's so hard. I would like to make a brief comment based on what Gina has just said. I'm so anxious and excited about reading your book. So let's put together launching, we can do partnership, Instituto Marielle Franco and Fundação Rosa Luxemburgo when we come together. But um, when we think about black women, we keep saying that Rio de Janeiro is the world militarization lab. Whatever people want to do in terms of um, lethal violence, it's done in Rio. And mainly youth, black youth die. And the moment black youth die, black women are the ones fighting for justice and supporting the families left behind. It's amazing to realize the three of the three of us have said uh, restructuring, reinventing oneself and moving on. And even uh, 
considering what Chris and Gina said, um, all of us Black women have been doing that. Thank you, Aniele. I would like to comment to answer to Gina's question that Quilombo Campo Grande from Minas Gerais, where people were recently evicted, and there was huge repercussion on what just happened. Unfortunately, it's one case among many, even in the face of the pandemic, the Brazilian state takes act eviction actions and removing families. And when we consider Quilombo Campo Grande, there were 22 families who lived there and the owner of the land had a huge debt with the government. But in spite of that, those 22 families were evicted. They were sent out and they had been living there for decades and doing work. Even in face of the pandemic, something as immoral as that happened, evicting families and destroying schools that were built within, within those territories. Even here in the city of Sao Paulo and the state of Sao Paulo, there have been plenty of evictions of homeless families. And as I was commenting before, institutional policies, they cater to an oppress, oppression project, uh, an oppression for death. It's immoral, you know, to have to face something like that during a pandemic where inequality, inequalities are deepened and as regards the families, um, families in the Quilombos, also indigenous peoples in Brazil, we've been facing a di difficult situation in Brazil. It's difficult to put it in words. COVID-19 is affecting Quilombos. COVID-19 is affecting people who live on the outskirts, people who live in uh, indigenous tribes, People are being evicted. Um, unemployment rates are soaring. There are plenty, plenty of issues facing us that we need to act and keep resilient. And as I said, when we started the, the live, our ancestry provides support for us to keep going. Undoubtedly, what we've been seeing is that the police is increasingly more violent, not only in favelas and the outskirts, but also those evictions against quilombos and indigenous people and um, disenfranchised people at large. I don't know if Aniele feels like making any comment about favelas in Rio de Janeiro. Whenever we think about what we're facing now, I remember what my mom and Marielle would tell me when I was little. I'm younger than Marielle, you know. They would um, um, tell me some things. So the moment you leave the house, you need to have your documents. And now we are facing pandemic and people are facing hunger, unemployment, people living on the street. And we still have police lethality, not only should we survive the pandemic, but we also must survive the police, the lethal police. It's so difficult to provide hope for people in the favelas. People in the favelas have recently taken it to the streets to protest and people criticized them, you know. I, I saw the protest uh, via the internet and pe 
people from questioning, are we dying because of COVID-19 or because of police lethality? And um, the government had, uh, the Supreme Court had said that no police operations were allowed, but still the police kept on carrying on incursions and operations in favelas. I believe that now everybody who's listening to me, now we're, we're having elections this year not only should we survive but also we need to pay attention to other problems such as unemployment unemployment rates are soaring i don't know what are you facing in um, um fundação rosa luxemburgo and we here from instituto marielle franco we get plenty of emails of people from favelas asking for help. One of my missions in the Instituto Marielle mission is to help people from favelas, not only the number of people uh, who have COVID-19. For example, Favela da Maré, where I come from, has a huge number of people te who tested positive for COVID-19. However, on the other hand, I, I think that yesterday or today, Complexo do Alemão has just been invaded by the police, a police operation, and we Black people have to struggle and survive. Uh, the pandemic is just another problem, right? Because as I said before, inequality and state violence they're deepening it's they're getting worse and worse but there is also a very powerful movement of social organization women's organization black movements and uh, grassroots movements trying to survive so providing courses for health professionals sharing food packets for families in need. In Salvador, Bahia, we've been providing, um, we're, we've been sending books together with food packets. And this is really a good initiative. And again, women are, Black women are on the front line. I would like to take the opportunity to say hello to Uli Hauerless. She's um, a co-worker from Berlin. Thank you for being here and listening to our debate. I would like to ask Gina a question by Elisa Odadeli, who works at the um, Sao Paulo office. And uh, she's a dear co-worker and she asked, I would like to ask Gina, um, as regards the climate crisis and the civilization crisis that we've been facing now, when we started, you commented on fires in California. and that relates to climate crisis, which is also the capitalist crisis. It's a crisis of the patriarchal system. Uh, the two things are intertwined. And here in Brazil, too, when we consider state policies, deforestation, is unstoppable in the Amazon. Recently, we've talked about fires in Pantanal, which is also a very important Brazilian biome. I would like to hear your view on that and how women relate to the climate crisis because they're the ones who suffer the most due to the impact of the climate crisis, I would like to hear your views on that. How do you perceive this issue? So it's so difficult to talk about this climate crisis because 
as it's been pointed out by the question, it's so connected to everything about how we have been living, to our built environment, to our modes of transportation, to our social organization. All of this is uh, contributing uh, to the problems we are having. I know we use sometimes the term here, which is somewhat controversial in my world, um, the Anthropocene. It's a, a name for this era when we are experiencing the, the great uh, devastations created by the human footprint on the land. It's a reminder actually that, as I said in the beginning, that there are many Black feminisms in Black feminism and they are not all the same. Um, the anti-capitalism that I've been trying to speak to is not necessarily the way of all of us who may identify as Black women. But it is important for us to, to notice um, those who have made our relationship to the earth uh, an important part of their work um, from, from early on. Um, in, in many ways, our ancestors, some of the slaves who were taken, it's often assumed that these people who were unskilled were brought to the place with people who had skills. But of course, we know this was not true. So many of our ancestors were selected to become slaves because of the understanding they had of the natural world, the way they could farm and the agricultural knowledge that they had. We need to build on that, but we also need to build on the part of our community that is connected to indigenous peoples here and elsewhere. And it is not, it should not be mutually exclusive to speak about black and indigenous people. But unfortunately, we often speak as if we have separate trajectories and it's very hard to interweave these um, stories together the way we should. Um, there is someone I will recommend for people to read who may not be known in Brazil, who often writes on these issues. Her name is Taya Miles. Uh, her name is spelled T-I-Y-A, her last name M-I-L-E-S. Uh, she's one of, of several people who have really tried to help us to see in a Black feminist history and uh, tradition, uh, our relationship to Indigenous people. And I say that to answer the question about the climate because it is often from Indigenous people that we uh, learn or hear about um, the harm we are doing to the earth. In the United States, we had the struggle against the pipeline and the water protectors were there and many in solidarity, but of course it is indigenous communities that are at the core and at the center of those struggles. So this is where as black feminists, we have to continue to learn. We have focused so much on our survival and sometimes that survival is defined only in terms of what we need to just make sure that those who are closest to us can make it to the next day. But we also have always been those who can see beyond our own struggles and we need to emphasize that tradition. And so for that reason, we need to simultaneously do both things. We need to help our local communities and we need to remind ourselves about the longer tradition of being connected to others who can teach us again about how to care for this earth. We have already done so much harm to it, um, but I also believe that the, we have the ingenuity, we have the capacity to dream and to invent, and we could be at the center of a transformation in the way we live. And I hope that's the case. Obrigada, Gina. Is Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Yes, this will be the case. We will transform. We are here prepared for that. 
this feminist legacy you referred to before, Gina, this legacy of the collective action of black women, this legacy of the diaspora, which has in black women a unique manifestation of uh, resistance and the creation of other narratives, other worlds, other possibilities, and uh, that we will continue to believe in more than believe. We continue to develop actions, as I said in the beginning, in different areas so that this will uh, come to fruition. We are reaching the end of our chat of our conversation where we've learned so much and uh, I would like to ask both of you if you have maybe some final comments if you'd like to make anything you want to address to our public before we uh, conclude our conversation our live and yeah please so I'd like to thank you it's always a pleasure to be with you and um i miss you i miss we can you know sitting together and having a caipirinha after work we work a lot so we only drink after work so yeah it's important to say oh no you guys just come together to have a beer or something no we work a lot and then by the end of the day we have a caipirinha so now in serious so i am a super fan of your work chris and gina thank you so much for the contribution i always learn with you i always reinvent and restructure myself I, it's not an easy moment we're living through for anyone and for us especially after 2018 nothing was easy nothing has been easy uh, we are now an election year a pandemic year and uh you know all the different demands that come to us and but being with you is always an enormous pleasure even if i haven't slept all night hours and hours awake breastfeeding but it's so good to be here you know so thank you and it's so great to be together uh, i hope we're able to meet uh, in person soon and to do this more and more and many many times whenever we have the possibility to do so thank you so much gina yes it's such a delight to see you too uh, it feels uh, restoring to me to be with you, as it always does when we are together. Um, this is just a little taste for the future. Uh, and it's true, it's, it's, these are things that we know, we know them because they're from our tradition, they've been taught to us. We know them because we practice them. But sometimes being together is necessary, it's a reminder it's a ritual that we need to make sure that we stay in this space. The, the part of Black feminism that I adore the most is the way that we get to just feel that love from each other. And in Brazil, you all know how best to always work, but always relax and have a good time and understand that we are also here to to be with each other to be happy to have joy and um it is a very hard time we are all in but we know how to do this and we also know that we must get together even if it's this way in order to continue to be able to work toward the future we want because the future is also now it's also the way we are living with each other the way we are connected so thank you so much for sharing, for always letting me know what's going on there, for always supporting us here in our work and know that we are all there for you too and um, thinking about you in these hard days that we share. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. I have a friend and uh, within this perspective, this moment that we're not able to see each other in person, as Gina said, uh, it was supposed to be in, uh, in person, you know, in the pre-pandemic schedule. But this friend of mine says that there are no border, borders for love, for affection. And I would add to that, saying that uh, affection is revolutionary. Love is revolutionary. Love in the sense, the broader sense of the word. And this is what supported our ancestors. And it also supports us for us to continue our struggle. So it's such a pleasure to have you here today, to see you here today, to see your faces. 
and uh, I'm I'm better because I walk with you. It is so strengthening and inspiring to know that we are together, that we support each other, and uh, we produce actions, knowledge. This is something that motivates and strengthens us. So I would like to thank you from the bottom of my heart, Gina, Anieli, for having opened, you know, some time to be with us today, for having shared your knowledge, your different visions and opinions. And I'm sure that, and uh, we talked about things that certainly will reverberate and echo not only in us, but all those who were listening to us online and they will maybe watch this video later on our different network. So thank you so much. I miss you guys so much, so much, but I'm sure that soon very soon we will be together again in person, maybe launching your book here in Brazil, who knows, maybe for your book launch, who knows. And uh, so thank you so much. Thank you to all the participants and uh, thank you to all the team here supporting us today. And I invite you all to watch the different content we have producing, not only on uh, Black feminism, but also social movements, uh, debates on mobility, uh, climate change. So thank you so much. Big, big kiss to my dear Gina, to dear Anieli. Good evening. And I will pass the floor to Catarini Flor. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, Gina, Dent. It was an amazing debate. Aniele Franco, thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to be here witnessing this moment to follow a debate such as this. And as you said, now at the end, this is something that will bring greater power and the way we have to deal with violence, all the violence that we suffer, that the Black population suffers, not only in Brazil, but in the US and other places around the world. But it's a struggle that also brings love, affection. And uh, it's such a pleasure to see Black women that are so empowered with such powerful voices participating in a debate such as this, not only participating in a debate, but also as our debate is called uh, action. It's not only debating, it's action, putting things into action. So if you who's if you're watching us now, if you enjoyed this, you can watch it again, if you wish, and share it with your friends, with a, a friend uh, who wasn't able to attend today. It will be made available on our Facebook channel. Just send uh, the link to your friends and also on our YouTube channel. The uh, version with interpretation is also available on our webpage. And if not only the video, if you want to know a little bit more about the content that we produce regarding uh, Black feminism, I created a special playlist on our YouTube channel for you to follow and see other debates that we have already uh, sponsored here in our foundation regarding the topic. So you can just uh, lo learn more about this topic and uh, send us any questions you might have. And the book here, Vozes, uh, Insurgent Voices, as I said in the beginning, will be made available, is already available on our page, uh, hazalux.org.br. And I will put it here on our networks, the book, for you to have the right link to download the book. And also this weekend, for instance, you can just use it to be your weekend read. So many voices for you to reflect and to see society from a different perspective, to reflect about the world. Thank you so much and uh, keep in touch through our my social media and to see what will be our next events, our next debate. So thank you so much.